My name is Janice B. Gordon and this is Scale Your Sales Podcast. Welcome to Scale Your Sales Podcast, listed number nine of 43 best podcasts for every sales professional. I am Janice B. Gordon, the customer growth expert, awarded the RevTech Strategist Award of 2024. In this week's episode of Scale Your Sales Podcast, I have not one, but two guests. We talk about their ebook, Seven Steps to Building Customer First Revenue Organizations. And they come from very different uh, perspectives of sales and how to make sales work. And the perspective is through the customer first lens. So we talk about the, the steps within the book. But what I really love about the book is that it's actionable. It uh, allows you to uh, really delve into what are the outcomes of the themes and the topics and where you find the data. So we we talk about revenue enablement and what's changed and how to make sure that it's really working for you. What is R2N2 and why it's so important? The North Star, why this is absolutely critical. It's almost like a foundation to understand the why you're doing it and, and why it's important to your, your customers and your revenue growth. My next guests are co-authors of the ebook seven steps to building a customer first revenue organization. Dr. Stephen Timmy, founder and president of Finlistic Solutions, a former finance professor and author of the bestseller Insight Led Selling, and Siobhan Thatcher, the GTM strategic transformation advisor who works with revenue and marketing leaders. Welcome to Scale Yourselves podcast, Dr. Stephen Timmy and Siobhan Thatcher. Hi, Hi Janice. Janice. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Now, you have seen um, Stephen on my podcast uh, before, but I would really love to introduce you to my new best friend. Sorry, <laughs> Stephen, you've been knocked off the perch. <laughs> Siobhan Thatcher. Now, we're in a group together um, or a LinkedIn group together and have various uh, discussions on women in sales. And so we will get into have a you know brief discussion about that in, in a moment. But would you, is there anything you'd like to say to the listeners since you're new to our podcast? I'm really excited about sharing some of the knowledge, some of the gains, some of the some of the don't do these. <laughs> from the you know the years that I've been doing it I've been doing it for a long time so there's been uh, there's a lot of experience here that I'd like to share thank you Siobhan it's it's great to have you now you two um have known each other for you know over a year but it was really since October when you did a joint presentation that this wonderful amazing resource came out of so it's an uh, ebook, Seven Steps to Building a Customer First Revenue Organization. So tell me more about th that. Siobhan, you want to go just sort of the background and I'll get into the, the steps? Sure. So uh, the reason it came together was every year there is a big enablement conference put on by the Revenue Enablement Society. And we want to cover topics that are really important. And one of the ones that we discovered was that most salespeople do not have the ability to speak the language or understand the finances and the deep knowledge of an organization that they're going to be speaking with. And so when they get into conversations with those folks that do speak that language, typically the C-suite, they can't they can't connect they're not connecting and so what the c-suite will do will push them down to the people in the organization that do speak the same language and that's typically not the level that you want to start at and so we saw that as a challenge to be able to not only explain why that's important but also how to get the information and then how as enablement people we can help with the facilitation of that knowledge into the sales organizations and what needs to be done. And, you know, we did our presentation, we got great feedback from it. And then uh, we were asked to do an ebook, which we did, which you just referred to. And then from the ebook, we've been asked to talk about it even more. So there is a, there's a hunger for this knowledge. 
And there isn't a lot of resource out there to show people and tell people how to do that and give them examples. Yeah, yeah. So Stephen, I've I've read your excellent bestseller book and it, you know, talking about how yeah. to have those those really important uh, conversations and how to in interpret all, uh, much of the financial data. So kind of bringing it into an enablement environment, what was the, what changed? What was the difference here? Yeah, yeah the, the overall structure about knowing the client's goals, how they're doing financially, you know, customizing or tailoring your message for the individual stakeholders, you know, as these buying groups continue to expand. The content uh, in terms of what revenue organizations need to know, None of that changed. The advantage of working with Siobhan is, I mean, look, she's she's a guru when it comes to enablement and but how do all the pieces fit together, right? It's not just enablement does this and then everyone. So uh, what the the seven steps are about is really, yeah, he, he, here's here's the content, but how do you make that come alive? How do you make that part? of the revenue organization, just the fabric of the organization, because we've done some research and I've never met a, an enterprise revenue organization that didn't say we're customer first. And then you start asking questions like, well, can, can I see your account plan? Mm, I see a bunch of references to you, not to your customer. You know, can you align your, your customer's goals and strategy with what you do? Oh, you can't. So I'm not being, I'm not being critical. Well, I guess I am, but anyway, so what's different about the book is here's a framework for pulling all the stakeholders together within the revenue organization and some really great ideas on what you have to do to create this and to sustain it. Yeah. What, what I love about the book, it's not just the seven steps, but it's actionable and detailed. So you have the themes, the outcomes, the topics. You know, it's so and where to find a lot of that data? It's really, really practical and actionable. Thank you. Yeah, good. And, and, you and that, that. that that was the intent. I mean, I, I you know, Janice, I used to be a professor, and, and I just couldn't take the theoretical and how do you apply it anymore? God bless my <laughs> friends who are still at the university, but no, that's what you want to do. It's, here's a practical guide of going and making it happen. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so let's um, get into some of the, the detailed elements uh, in the, the, you know, the, the seven steps. Why seven? It just seemed like a good number. I think there's something magical about seven, like seven habits or seven. What is. So quite frankly, Siobhan and I just went through and said, OK, you know, do this, do this, do this. Oh, it turns out to be seven. So there's nothing magical about let's fit into seven steps. Right. I remember when I was doing programming that if you were doing nested tables, they said, never go beyond seven because the human mind can't handle anything more than that. So, so like, this okay. is why we have an enablement guru here. That's <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so um, tell me more about um, the key elements to building a customer first revenue organization. Yeah, and Siobhan, I've, I've printed out the seven steps if you want me to read through those. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, so, and we can talk about these in more detail. The North Star, like, why are we even doing this? The next thing is building the revenue team. It does not say building the enablement program, the revenue team. Uh, create a strategic execution playbook. Everyone's on the same page. Here's how we're going to get this done. Uh, establishing the sales competency. And Janice, you mentioned, for example, financial acumen, business acumen, those things. Industry insights. I mean, if you're going to sell into an industry, you need to know a little bit about it. You don't need to be a McKinsey or Deloitte industry expert, but you need to know the environment in which the, you know, your client's operating in and uh, you know, cultivating customer insights and aligned solutions. Okay, how do the pieces fit together? Which most organizations cannot do. Most are still focused on features and functions, which as you know, executives, at least the ones I know, could care less about. And then it's really all about the ongoing nour nourishment. So those are the, the seven steps. Right, right. Okay. So then one of them is kind of North Star. So why we're doing, why is that so important? Siobhan, that has your name written all over it. I learned that from you. Yeah, I, I think the North Star is you have to have an understanding and a real belief in why you're doing what you're doing. And why is the customer doing what they're doing? 
right? These conversations that we have with customers all the time is we ask them a question and while they're answering, we're busy composing the next question in our mind. And it, you, you don't listen, right? That is one of the biggest failings that I see in sales and, and everybody actually doesn't have to be sales is when you're talking to people, you're, you're thinking about what your next question is gonna be instead of actually listening. And so the North Star has a, a, a number of points. One of them is listen. Another one is be curious. Another one is you have to partner. Not only do you have to partner with your customer, but you also have to partner with the folks that you are in this, you know, selling franchise with to work with this customer so that that poor customer doesn't have to try to figure out who to work with in your company. You figure out who to work with for them and you create that North Star, that bond in order to move that forward. And then the, you know, the other, it's having the knowledge. It's actually doing the research with the advent of a lot of the new tools you can get that research done exceedingly fast. It has to be vetted, right? Everybody saw the example of glue on pizza as the you know most favorite thing that came out of Google last week. No. And so you have to vet it and you have to make sure that the information you're seeing does sound reasonable. But you need to get that information before you go into this call. It can't be just a product, 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 product. It can't be a checklist, yeah. right? Those days are over because the customer's already know the checklist by the time you're talking to them. What they want to know is do you understand what their pains are and are those their pains your pains and is what you're talking about helping them with those pains. You're not selling to them. You want to help them buy. And if not from you, buy from someone else. Because if you do that, they'll come back to you. And you know, looking at this, Janice, uh, from a from a finance person's perspective, is one the North Star, just, just as Siobhan said or implied. Part of it's like, it shouldn't be a good experience buying from us. I mean, it shouldn't be a great customer experience. Shouldn't they want to come back? And the other part within the revenue organization is, well, what are we trying to solve here? Is our closure rate low? Is our pipeline not big enough? You know, cross sell up so. And, and have some metrics in place that say, you know, nothing's perfect, but we're going to track these. What was the impact of this? You know, not just on the client, which is number one, but from a financial perspective as a for-profit organization, what are we getting out of this? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I talk about enablement, there's three pieces to it for any mm -hmm. program, which is the insight, what are you seeing? It is the uh, implementation of a, an initiative of some type. How do you think you're going to do it? And then there is the impact. And the impact that we're measuring is the impact as it has to do with productivity or attrition or what actually makes the revenue leaders' hearts grow three sizes in one day, right? Those are the, that's the outcomes that they're looking for. Not how many people went through a course, not the average yeah. score. Not the, you know, the, the ESAT of, you know, did they like the course or not? They couldn't care less. They don't care. What they care about is how is it impacting our revenue? Is productivity going up? Is attrition going down? Attrition of employees, attrition of customers. Is it going down? Because that's where we're losing a lot of revenue. We're losing a lot of, uh, a lot of revenue that way. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Okay. Siobhan, I've got an, um, I'm curious as to what does R2N4 mean? Oh, <laughs> so in my, in my, I love talking about this. In my enablement career, and it's been long and varied, I call my career a jungle gem. It's not a ladder, right? It's, just, it's been all over the place. But what I've learned is that there is a linchpin for any programs to actually work, for any enablement to be successful. There has to be what I call R2 and 4, which is responsible to, not for. And what it comes down to is accountability and responsibility between the strategic partnership between enablement and sales management. Notice I didn't say sellers. In my case, my sellers are my end users. My stakeholders are frontline managers and up. And R2 and 4 means I am and my team is responsible to create and prepare and deliver the best possible content, messaging, scripts, whatever it is we need to do for the selling organization. So the customers that, that, so the discussions they have with their customers 
are absolutely paramount to what the customer needs. So they sound different, look different, are different, and are aligned. So we're responsible to do that. We are not responsible for the sale itself. And what that means is once all of these programs are created in conjunction and collaboration with the sales leaders, right? We ask them, we don't just go off and say, oh, we're going to, right? We ask them what's really important. That sales management team from frontline and up are responsible for the execution of those programs. So whenever I hear a sales leader go, we didn't make our quarter because enablement failed. My response is, you wanted my enablement people to go out and close all your business? <laughs> and of course, they're like, "What? Uh, oh, exactly. We created these programs to help you. If you don't execute on these programs, there's nothing that we can do. It's, it's the adage of bringing a horse to water, right? We can bring the horse to water, but, you know, we can teach them. doesn't mean they learned it. And they learn it by doing. And they do it by coaching from their managers by the understanding about that this, you know, a lot of this stuff is an optional and by applying it within daily, what it is that they are doing. And then by the tracking of it. So that's what R2N4 means. That means I'm responsible to you sales manager, you're responsible for execution. And if that combination is the linchpin that makes all these programs work. And that's what I was going to say. That combination of those two is that when the heart grows, when it actually flows yeah. beautifully between the two, the relationship is in the equilibrium. That's when the heart grows. Yeah, because you don't, no enabler wants to be the stick, right? The carrot and the stick. The moment you become the stick, anything you do from that point forward in the eyes of a sales organization is a chore because yeah. you're the teacher bang, bang, do this, do this. We don't want that. We don't want that at all. That needs to be their manager. Their manager needs to do it. And at, in the flow of work as part of coaching, we want to be the carrot so that learning and career advancement and professional uh, experience is a choice that they're making, not a chore to uh, uh, I have to do this. <laughs> Right? And that and that's the difference, because yeah. what happens is if you've got one influential sales manager who doesn't want to do it. And the authority <laughs> is not there to have them do it, then it can be a house of cards. So any I've had situations where I've had to call up my CRO and say, we've got it. We've got a problem, child. I need your help. And I've been very, very fortunate. The CRO has not said to me, hey, look, we're closing business, bug off. The CRO has said, tell me who it is, what is it, what can I do to help? And they've come down that side to say, this is important, you must do it. And they fix the issue, not us. Yeah, yeah. So I'm you know, wondering with the book then, how how are we going to make, how do we make this work? Because it seems to me with the, the book and the seven steps and the, the fact that it's so detailed, that's almost... The kind of part of the job of enablement, you provided them not only with the content, but with the steps to actually do it. So now I'm looking at within the organization, where does this, this book and the information sit and who, how are they able to use it to coach the team to do a better job about nurturing the customer first relationship? You know, uh, Janice, I'll, I'll take that one first. But, you know, obviously it's, it's relevant to enablement because Siobhan and I have had this discussion many times. Most people view enablement as a cost center, not as a revenue center. So our friends in enablement, hey, here, here's, a, here's a framework for you to be viewed as a revenue generator, not a cost center. The second thing, and I was having this uh, discussion with uh, Ben Cagle who, at Finlistics, who you all know, and we were talking about, you know, the CRO's agenda and how, how many really have an agenda other than you're know, going to grow revenue X. And so if you really think about those seven steps is that it's also the CRO as an example that would say, we're, honestly, where's my organization from a customer first perspective? Siobhan and I provide some details around, you know, if you could have first quartile closure rate, if you could have first quartile uh cross sell up so here's the financial benefits so really it's it's for 
those stakeholders to say, you know, here, here's a framework for us to work together, to communicate with each other, not just enable and takes it. Hey, we got this great idea. I mean, it's, it's, it's gotta be the fabric of the organization. If not enablement can create all they want, but Siobhan, as you just said, if sales in behind, it's just like, okay, here's another requirement. I got to take some more medicine. This is great. Yeah. And from the being able to have that discussion about how they spend their money and how their, how their budgets can increase with just a small percentage. If you, you know, tweak this dial and tweak this dial, here's what the actual money will look like. That is not a conversation a lot of salespeople have, but when they go to the CFO to say, okay, we want the money for this, the CFO says, well, what's it going to do for us? Mm -hmm. If they are so well prepared that when they go in, not only can they say it, but their manager can say it, so can the CRO, so can the SFO, so can the COO, so can the, right? Every single C-level is going, oh, I get it. And it makes it a no-brainer. It makes it a no-brainer because you just showed them, you make this small change and given your history, and oh, by the way, here's all your history that we're aware of, given your history, here's what's going to happen. We can predict what it's going to look like. And, you know, you're going to hit ROI at that point. Is that fast enough for you? No? Well, then how about if we do this? We can bring it in. So having those conversations are critical. Right now, people are not spending money. So let's show them how that spending money is going to help them make money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love that. Love that. You know, like revenue organizations are, you know, struggling to align their solutions to the client goals and, and, and strategies. And I know that you've done some researches to, yeah. you know, how much more they can, can benefit when they move away from the kind of features and functions. Yeah, uh, Janice, it's, it's in the uh, Insight Led Selling book, but I believe it's something like 20% of organizations say, when we know the goals, we can align our solutions. Something like 50% is like, even when we know the goals, we can't align our solutions. We don't know how to put them together. And then another 30% say, oh, we're still promoting features and functions. So that's one of the things in, in this book uh, that we talk about. It's like, well, how do you make that alignment? If you know the customer's goal is to expand profit margins by enhancing the omni-channel experience and you provide, for example, customer insights, how do you make that connection? And then how do you talk much earlier on in the sales cycle? What are the potential financial benefits? How do you speak in business terms, not feature function terms? So we, we talk about that in the Insight Let's Selling book. And in this one, we, we reinforce it that it's not just Enablement's job to make that connection, sales job to make that connections. I mean, there's there's a number of people in that group. It's a team effort to make that connection, which is fine. If you can't do that, short meeting. I've had plenty of those short meeting because we didn't do our job. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's almost like a common language, isn't it? And you've bridged it across different functions that need to be talking about um, and enabling everyone in the organization in order to to reach the goal of uh, being a future a customer focused uh, customer led organization. Yeah, I like to um, I use this little graphic in that most customer most environments, the customer is right here at the bottom of this triangle and they are trying desperately to figure out who am I supposed to be working with? <laughs> in this company and what you want to do is this you want to turn it the other way and you want to put the customer here and then all of these groups coordinate across the whole buyer journey and that includes acquisition and retention to get to them and talk to them and be there for them without them having to figure out what that should be we are the ones who do it much, much more than they do. They may buy once every five years. We are selling every single hour of every day. We're the experts. We need to coordinate across the whole organization to make sure as experts, we are providing that for the customers instead of them having to go go. That's customer first. 
I think that's really interesting. And I really love the kind of triangle turn the, the, the other way around, because in organizations, they talk a lot about cross-functional teams and having that conversation and bring it in. But it almost seems like, OK, we're doing this, but we don't know why we're doing it, uh, you know, uh, and uh, we don't know what the aim will be. We don't know what the benefit is going to be. And so we're having these conversations. We're working closely together, but there's nothing to, to hang it on to. And it seems like actually that's what you've done. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, what, what you hear all the time is I did my job. Over you. <laughs> Right. But that's not how that's not how customers buy. All of us know that. Right. I mean, we like to think of the customer journey as a linear event. No, <laughs> it's not. It's like, ee, do, 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 boop, do, beep, up, down. Oh, go back to the beginning. Now nah, come up here. Do, 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 do. Spend a lot of time right here in negotiation because you waited too long for it. Boop, do, do, do. And sometimes it's out because you missed something and sometimes it's forward. But it's that whole thing that can get crazy. And I know salespeople are determined to keep it on that linear path. And they may make one sale, but they won't make another, not to this customer. Yeah. You That's know, it, they buy. Janice, to add to what you said about why, why, is, why is the customer really doing this? Mm -hmm. And most people don't know. And, and one of my favorite examples, one of our clients, we first started with them and they sold forecasting and uh, they were talking to a retailer and they're going on and on and on to the chief merchandising officer about how they can generate 10,000 forecasts in a minute and using all this technical language that the merchandiser was like. And so it really wouldn't go anywhere. And so I asked my clients, why are they doing this? Well, they want better forecasting. Well, why do they want better forecasting? Because they want to have a lower mean squared error. And I'm like, so I said, let's just ask them. And so it's like, well, Mr. Or Ms. VP of merchandising, why do you want a better forecast? He goes, oh, I want to have a higher sell-through rate so we don't have as much in markdowns, as much in ops uh, inventory. That's why they were really doing it. it the guy, I, he, he could have been using an abacus or something. He didn't care. He just wanted a better sell-through rate and lower markdowns. So for our friends out there, always ask why. You know, they're going to get a new ARP system. Why? They're going to the cloud. Why? They're doing digital transformation. Why? Okay. But always ask the why. And sometimes you, sometimes in the public domain, and then sometimes for the individual stakeholders within an organization, it's okay. I understand you're doing digital transformation, Janice. You're in operations. What, what, what is your goal? What are you really trying to get out of this? Ask. Yeah. I yeah, think most sales people driver, are getting. Isn't it? Right. Yeah, what most people, salespeople are getting are documents that are lowest common denominator about how to go after this vertical or how to go after this role or how to go. And, and they're using it as the, as the, the script instead of actually just asking questions, ask questions and yeah. find out what yeah, I want from marketing. I don't want a script from marketing. I want 10 open-ended questions that I can ask. That's yeah. what I want from marketing. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the motivations of people can take you in a completely different direction. Mm -hmm completely different direction and often it's a personal motivation and really mm -hmm. understanding why and it isn't always organizational we've got to get away from b2b is not business to business it's human to human and yeah. all of our failings and personality and personal motivations yeah. are the things that actually you know direct the decision it's it's often it's an emotional decision that's justified up by the logic of it well, especially if you're selling to marketing, the average tenure of a CMO is less than four years. So they're they're two years into their job. And I don't think I'm gonna come up with a strategic plan for them, right? It's like, hey, I, I gotta I gotta show some results real quick, or you know, my CEO is gonna be a new one. So I mean, you're you're right. There's a, a lot of emotional uh, you know, considerations in there, but at the same time, at the end of the day. How, how much money are you going to generate for me and how quickly do I get it? Yeah, yeah. So let me kind of take a little step back. I'm curious as to what do you mean, just so the audience here are completely clear, what do you mean about a customer focus? What, what are we really talking about here? Siobhan, you want to take that one? Sure. When I talk about customer focused, I mean that it is their 
challenges, their goals, their dreams, their future, their um, current issues. That's what matters. That's what matters right now. And our conversations with them need to, first of all, uncover those because a lot of times they just don't know. And there may be something going on and you can give them some insight into that. It is helping them understand what the future could be, right? And how, how their world could change dramatically. It's helping them understand that this is the process that we use as sellers, but we want to take the process we use as sellers and we want to make sure that it is aligned in the right way with how you buy customer. How do you buy? Do you buy? You have huge budgets. How do you determine how to spend that budget, right? It's asking these questions and it's putting their needs and their requirements first, instead of going in there saying, we're ABC company and we you know, have these fabulous features and products and oh, why oh, wouldn't you buy us? <laughs> Look at all the things we do. Look at all the customers we sell to. I love that logo slide. Don't, don't forget, Siobhan, that, logo slide. Don't, don't forget that. And we're in 130 countries. And we're in 130 countries. I love. I remember seeing that very, very early in my career. And I asked the, the seller, the sales rep that was doing it. I said, "Who cares?" And he looked at me. And I said, "Who cares if you're in 130 countries? What does that mean?" I was like, "Well, uh, uh, uh." I said, "Here's what it means. It means that you are in a time zone that your customer is in, which means when they have a challenge, you're in a time zone that can help them. You're around the world. You speak their language. You're aligning. That's what it means." Not that you have 130 offices. Nobody cares. You know, Janice, I'll add to that. You know, the Casey brothers founded UPS about 100 years ago, right? You know, in a parcel service. And I mean, this is like one of the first customer for, I wasn't around then, but they said. When the earth was cooling, me too. We, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> when the ice was still melting. And um, so, no, they said, look, we take care of our customers. We're taking care of UPS. And that's really what this is about. Everything Siobhan said, if we can facilitate that, then it's it's not going to, it's never easy, like Rumi growing at 2x everyone else. But, you know, without that, I mean, how are you going to be okay? I don't think you are, especially in this environment. So let me ask you, what do you think is the percentage of companies that are truly customer first? We... We did a survey, actually had some consultants look at this, our own, you know, uh, anecdotal evidence. The max is 25%. I think, Siobhan, you, even you said it's less than that. So. I think it's less than that. I think it's less than that. I think it is. It's growing because companies have finally decided and determined that, oh, CS really does matter. Right. If you're if you're going to land somewhere, the way you expand is through the customer service side of the business and the customer support side of the business, the CX side. And if you can't say, do you want fries with that in that role, then you're never going to expand. And so it is it's making sure that the right parts of the business are in place and that they're they're asking the right questions and that everybody, everybody is a seller. Everybody, everybody stands for the company. Everybody needs to know why the company exists. Everybody needs to be able to have that conversation about why customers buy from us. Not what we sell, why customers buy from us. Every time I hear about elevator pitches, it's about what we sell. No, no, your elevator pitch is why do customers buy from us? What do we solve? Not what do we sell? It's a very different conversation. And that's what customer yeah. facing is really about. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that. And, you know, uh, anyone listening on this call, I'll put a link in the, the show notes. If you want to know how to do this, you've now got the seven steps to building a customer first revenue organization. These are the steps that are going to help you to do that. So how can listeners get hold of you? What would be the best place? Uh, I, I'm accessible on LinkedIn. Happy for you to connect with me there. Um, easy to find. If it asks you for my email, it's just my first name, Shivon at Gmail. Again, being around since the earth was cooling. I think I was number 8,000 with, you know, when Gmail, first day, first day. I had it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my first name, gmail.com. Yay. 
Um, and I can also be reached on, you know, I wouldn't call me because I get a lot of calls, but you could text me or you could send me a DM in, uh, in LinkedIn. That's the best way. Yeah. And for me, LinkedIn, you know, Steve, I think it's Dr. Stephen Timmy on LinkedIn. That's T-I-M-M-E, as well as you can reach me through my company, which is Finlistics. And so info at Finlistics.com. Finlistics is also on LinkedIn. So those, those are those are the best ways uh, to, to get in touch with me. Okay. So I'm going to wrap up with one, one uh, question to you both. Who is your hero or shero? So Siobhan. Uh, I, it was funny when that question came in, I didn't answer it right away, but then I saw Melinda Gates donate $1 billion to helping women in business. And that's my Shiro right there. Absolutely. Yeah. Talk about putting your money where your mouth is. A oh billion God. dollars. Yeah. yeah. Nuts. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my my Shiro uh, has got to be Coco Goff, the tennis player. I saw her at the U.S. Open the first year she was coming out and people were going crazy. She's talented. She's calm. She's cool. I've never seen her get frustrated. And I don't care how far behind she is in a set or a match. I'm always like, she, she can win this. Yeah, she can do this. So... <laughs> <laughs> that is that is inspirational to me. Love Coco Golf. Yeah, yeah, I I I, lo I love that. She is a uh, and she's so elegant to to watch as well, and 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 really tough. That's that's incredible. Two incredible women. Thank you very much um, for that. This has been an absolute pleasure. I will put the the book details in in the show notes. Love talking to you both. It's always very insightful and educational. And I really love what you've done here because it is a blueprint, a framework, but with all of the actionable steps in it um, to become a customer first revenue organization, which is what we all need. Thank you so much for being a guest on Scale Your Sales podcast, Siobhan and Stephen. Thank you, Janice. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Janice. Thanks, everyone, for listening to us. Happy selling. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Scale Your Sales podcast. If you like this discussion, feel free to listen to other episodes or watch the caption show on YouTube and subscribe to future episodes. I would really appreciate it if you would leave a positive review on iTunes. Thank you.